Let's give us our confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let's greet the person beside us. God sees your heart. With this, today's message is entitled, The Heart is Important. For the past two weeks, there has been the Olympics, which was held in Paris, France, and it will come to an end tomorrow morning. Due to the time difference with Paris, many important events were held late at night or early in the morning. But despite the heat waves, the enthusiasm for supporting our national athletes were intense. Contrary to initial expectations for our Korean teams, our team actually won many more medals. And seeing the expectations, we are we expected to win maybe five medals, but we won almost a double of our expectations and gave us great results. And particularly, Korea ex excelled in shooting, fencing, and archery. Shooting, fencing, and archery was where Korea particularly excelled in. And winning many medals, Korea's stature in the world of sports went up. We are seventh. And that's quite significant. And so there's only 195 nations mentioned by the UN, but there are actually more than that. And to go to be in within the 10, the first 10, and that's an amazing thing. And so in this nation that has no natural resources, to be within the 10, 10th, 10 nations, the first 10 nations, when it comes to the economy and even in the Olympics, that is an incredible fact. And I, I believe that God desires to use this nation. And even those 10 medals were all gold medals. Most notably, archery achieved an incre incredible feat by sweeping all the events. The women's team event achieved its 10th consecutive victory, maintaining the number one position in the world for 40 years. And so, why is it that they, they excel in archery? It's because they don't use any other methods or no humanism. They just use the skills at that time or the athletes that are equipped with the skills. It's just archery that is that way. Other associations or other sports, they have, there's a lot of rumors. And even within the association itself, there are issues, but... And, and so even if athletes are really good, they many of them are unable to actually play during the Olympics. Even our elder Kim's son, his son now is, is a well-known athlete, but back then, the coaches wouldn't even let him play. You needed to have some type of backer to be able to play regardless of your skill. But when it comes to archery, it's not like that. And so they only look at how well the athletes are for that time. Regardless of whether you've won a medal in the past, you need to be good for that upcoming game. And so many other nations tried to defeat our country, but in the end, we took the gold medal. And that's why most, mostly the, the judge for archery are Koreans. They tell, the Korean coaches tell the, the, their athletes to not even think about winning. They just have them focus and concentrate. When it comes to the key aspect of archery, it's to hit the center of the target, which scores 10 points. And if there is a tie, the athlete that shot closest to the center would get the victory. 
This was the case in the final men's individual event in a shoot-off between Korea's Kim Woo-jin and a U.S. athlete. At the, in the end, they had to shoot three times, both shot 10 points. And watching it, I was amazed they all shot 10 points. And so the, it was a last shoot-off where they had to only shoot once. And both again shot 10 points. But Kim Woo-jin's arrow was closer to the center by 4.5 millimeters. It was 10 points, both of them, but Kim Woo-jin's arrow was closer to the center, earning him the gold medal. It gave me chills. You know, while watching, I, I, I was squirming at the edge of the seat, unwittingly. Even goes the same with shooting. Who shoots closest to the center? That determines the victory. Why am I emphasizing the target, the center so much? What's today's title? It's the heart that is important. However, the center in the passage has a slightly different meaning than the center in archery or shooting targets. The center of a target refers to the middle, but in the passage, the heart literally means a firmly held mind, a firm thought or attitude. This is what it refers to. A firmly held mind, a heart that has firmly held onto the word, or a firm thought or attitude. Whether one grows in faith or not, depends largely on what kind of center or heart one has. With what heart does one worship? With what heart does one live their walk of faith? You must have the right heart based on the Word of God, and Satan will hinder you to fail in worship and attack you and spread weeds within your hearts and attack you continuously so that you may not be able to concentrate, so that you may not be able to hold on to the word, so that you may not be able to proclaim the word. Satan will continuously attack you and only when you hold on to the word will answers arise and will growth occur. And what is at the core of that? What is at the core, the essence of that? It is only Christ, only the kingdom of God and only the filling of the Holy Spirit. That must be at the heart. And if this is so, then you are able to overcome everything. As we saw last Sunday, after Jesus entered Jerusalem to fulfill his essential mission on earth, the Jewish leaders launched continuous attacks against him. And they attempted to completely corner and kill Jesus. And so the chief priests, scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, and elders took turns attacking him continuously. However, their efforts were in vain. However, in today's passage, we see a completely opposite phenomenon. Instead, it is Jesus who is questioning them. How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David, he asks. The core of Jesus' question was, who is the Christ? Both then and now, the fundamental issue of a walk of faith is, is who is Jesus Christ to me? Who is Jesus Christ to you? And you must be able to give a clear answer to this question. Many people miss the essence and core of Christianity. And they judge and criticize based on the introductory matters. And they run errands for Satan with those things. What is the decisive reason for this? It is their own standard, their own thoughts for this misconception and misjudgment. 
Humans are finite. They're limited. However, God, who is unlimited, who is infinite, we try to interpret an infinite God within our own boundaries. And we try to trap God's word inside our own thoughts and try to interpret it that way. We try to judge it that way. Then what is the result? It only leads to an absurd situation. I always tell you, when it comes to your thoughts, your judgments, you don't even have an IQ of 200. And yet, you try to comprehend God's infinite and amazing, incomprehensible plans. Through today's passage, Jesus once again teaches biblically who He is and warns against the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. He also explains this to His disciples by giving an example and emphasizing the correct heart shown by the poor widow. May you firmly grasp the essence of faith through today's passage and rescue those who are still trapped in a religious life of formality, wandering back and forth on the outskirts of church and wandering in the problem Genesis 3. May you be able to open your spiritual eyes. Point number one, it is the wrong show. Verse 35, and as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? We must carefully interpret the content of Jesus' question. This question does not mean that Christ is not the son of David. At that time, the Jews believed that Christ would come as a descendant of David. But they did not believe that he would come in the flesh. They did not they were not aware that Jesus, that God himself would come as a human. They knew that Christ would come. But they did not know how he would come. They did not know that God would come as flesh. And therefore, Jesus, to make them understand, asked this question to enlighten them. And to change their wrong thinking, he gives an example to explain. Verses 36 to 37, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. Jesus quoted Psalm 110.1, which was written by David. Here, David makes the following confession. He says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David says that God spoke to my Lord, and here Lord refers to the Christ. David, who would come to earth, David is calling Christ, who would come to earth through his lineage in the distant future, my Lord. To call someone my Lord, that itself is to acknowledge that one is greater, higher, and superior to oneself. My Lord is greater, is higher, and superior to me. That is when you can acknowledge that you call someone my Lord. And although Christ would come in the flesh through David's lineage, David is saying that Christ is someone much greater than just a descendant. In other words, David is confessing that the Christ who would come through his lineage is the Son of God. Mark reveals that this confession by David was made under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And in Romans 1, 3-4, it is also testified regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the Holy Spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. It clearly testifies. We must interpret the Bible with the Bible. We must realize through this text that Jesus Christ is fully 
human, and fully God. He is 100% human and 100% God. And the mystery of Jesus Christ who would save humanity is hidden in this truth. Only a perfect human can be the representative of humanity. He could only, by being 100% human, die in the place of humans. And only a sinless God has the qualifications, the conditions to atone, atone for the sins of all mankind. So he must be sinless. The Savior must, the Christ must be God and be human. He had to be, he needed to have he needed to possess both divine and human natures. However, there is nothing among created beings that can satisfy this requirement. There are many gods, many religions right now in the world. But there is no salvation in that at all because salvation lies only in Jesus Christ. Angels are also incredible beings. But why is the angels cannot be our savior? Because they have no physical bodies. They have no death. They are eternal beings. They ha the savior must die, but they cannot. angels cannot die. Human beings who are descendants of sinful Adam are all born as sinners. Therefore, how can a sinner forgive another sinner? And that is why God opened the way through Genesis 3.15, through the offspring of the woman, not an offspring of man, but an offspring of the woman. There's only one, and that is Jesus Christ. Not descendants of sinful humanity, but Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born through the Virgin Mary. Nowadays, women can give birth even without being married. They can they might they and so even without getting married because of medical advancements they're able to ha have children by inseminating themselves using medical technology however jesus was conceived by the holy spirit and he was born through the virgin mary and because only and only Jesus Christ is the true Savior who solved the problem Genesis 3 and opened the perfect way of salvation. Therefore, all we need to do is believe. And when we believe, we become children of God. What does it become to become a child? What does it mean to become a Christian, a saint? It means that you have eternal life. We all have eternal life. Our flesh one day will go back to the ground. However, when it comes to our spirit, it lives forever. And therefore, we've received eternal life. There's something that you must clearly look at. A life that only views the Messiah, the Christ, as a physical, in a physical sense, it won't bring change. No matter how much one reads the Bible or even majors in it, if they do not grasp the incident of Genesis 3, they cannot nothing will take place even when it comes to the scribes they were all experts when it comes to the Bible but if you do not realize the truth and the crosses re atonement resurrection and ascension and the second coming of Jesus Christ who came to solve this problem they will live an unhappy life that opposes God look at read verse let's read verses 38 to 40 and in his teaching he said beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feast who devour widows houses and for a pretense make long prayers they will receive the greater condemnation after Jesus cited the words of Psalms to reveal that he is both truly human and truly God he also warned the scribes and Pharisees who were steeped 
in show and hypocrisy without understanding spiritual truths. The term hypocrisy or show in the original language implies a complete difference between the outward and inward selves. In reality, it is a problem that long-term believers may fall into more easily than those who are just starting their walk of faith. In the walk of faith, what matters is what lies within one's inner life rather than what is visible on the outside. The outward show may be more or less the same, making it impossible to criticize each other because it's pretty much the same. But people like to criticize and judge each other with that. Therefore, what is important is the center of the heart from which one lives. With one center and heart are you walking your walk of faith. So people fail to realize that they have a log witch in their eye, but they try to criticize the speck in the other's eye. In 1 Samuel 16.7, it emphasized, people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. There are not many people who understand this. Everyone looks at the outward appearance, but what does the Lord look at? He looks at one's heart. And so you may look at some individual and think, oh, that person does not seem like he has something great about him, but why is it that that person receives so much more answers than I do? How is it that people who are so kind, they fail and perish, but why is it that people who are ill-mannered and have a bad personality are receiving answers? When we look at it, we may not understand. But how is it that they receive answers? Who is it that gives the answer? It is God. And what does God see? What does God see to give that answer? It is one's heart. It is the heart. And of course, how people look at you is also important. But what's more important than that is how God looks at you. He looks at your heart. There's a saying, the law of the unchanging original. Nowadays, many people undergo plastic surgery. But no matter how much one changes their appearance, once they marry and have children, the original traits come out. And that's when you look at celebrities, you're surprised because their original face and their face after surgery is di so different. It's not to say that plastic surgery is bad, but it means that no matter how much one pretends to be holy or diligent in their walk of faith outwardly, unless the heart or the original nature is changed, it is all in vain. How can you tell? By looking at the answers by their fruits. You don't need to rationalize anything. All you got to look at is their fruits. May all the members of Yewon Church become only Christ. May your life be centered on only God's kingdom. Only. Only. And because we cannot do this with our own strength and ability, what must we do? We must be filled with only the filling of the Holy Spirit. Only when God gives us the filling of the Holy Spirit can we do this. Because without the filling of the Holy Spirit, you cannot do the work of God. Without the filling of the Holy Spirit, if you try to do the Lord's work, then you'll use humanism and you'll live in your own level. And that's why you must be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the power that comes from the filling of the Holy Spirit. May you be fully armed with this life of the three onlys and expand both your spiritual and physical tents. Point number two, it is the right heart. Verses 41 to 42. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and the poor widow came and put in two smaller copper coins, which make a penny. Jesus explains to his disciples the contrast between a life of hypocrisy and a life of true faith through the example of the rich and the poor widow's offering. The rich put large amounts of money into the offering boxes, but while the poor widow put in two small coins, which amount to a quadrant. 
Back then, the offering box had an entrance shaped like a trumpet. So it was also called a trumpet box. And this trumpet box was made of brass. And back then, paper money didn't exist. So the sound of the coins falling could give an idea of how much one had given offering. And because God was the one who would receive the offer, you couldn't really see the offering itself, but you could hear it. And by that, you could guess and estimate how much one was pouring in. By putting in many coins, the rich made loud and noisy sounds. And you, one might think, wow, that person's giving a lot of offering. The issue, however, was that their offerings were not intended for God. And it wasn't given before God, but were given with the intention of showing off and seeking recognition from others. It had nothing to do with God. On the other hand, the passage tells us that the poor widow gave two small coins, which is equivalent to a quadrant. The, at that time, the leptin were the Jewish currency and the quadrants was the Roman currency. And because Mark was written, the book of Mark was written for a Roman audience, both currency units were recorded. The leptin and the quadrants are the smallest units of currency in both nations. And that is what she put into the offering box. Do you think it would have made a noise? I think it, it would have been less than a thousand Korean won. Because it was the smallest currency. It probably didn't make any noise. However, this widow didn't care at all about what others thought. She simply offered her heart to God. She said, this is all I have. And she gave her heart. Look at verses 43 and 44. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The devotion of the poor widow, which Jesus acknowledged, was a true and complete devotion. At that time, widows were in a socially difficult position, struggling even to make a living. Despite that, this widow wanted to give to God so much, even though she had nothing. And even people, even regardless of whether people might mock her for giving so little, she gave all herself with a sincere heart to God. Two leptins might have been equivalent to about 10 Korean won or maybe 100 Korean won. However, Jesus emphasized that this poor widow's offering was one that God accepted. Everyone, we must give the offering that God receives. We no longer, we no longer give offering during we no longer pass around the offering basket, but we give it online or in the offering stations so that you may give before God. And even when it comes, comes to our bulletin, now we ha have created a separate page for the offering so that you may give it before God. It's a time schedule for our church members and believers to up their spiritual levels. You must give it before God. It doesn't matter even if it's small. Just give it wholeheartedly. No one's watching. Everything I have is the Lord's. That is what an offering is. What I have is the Lord's. And so from what is the Lord's, I give one-tenth of it. 
Thank you for allowing me to live a healthy life for the past month, and that's your tithe. Oh, I had so many difficulties, and thank you for solving that, God, and that's your Thanksgiving offering. And on a Sunday, God, thank you for giving me the health and the environment to be able to come on a Sunday and worship you. And to give offering for you, that is your Sunday offering. And even though I can't go, I am receiving the answers of the sending missionary. And so for that, you give a missions offering. You give it before God. That is the offering confession of faith that God receives pleasingly. Since the founding of our church and throughout its growth, I have always had deep gratitude for the help, heartful, heartful dedication of all our Yewon family. The church construction continued up to the consecration of the main sanctuary, and it was through the offerings given with all their hearts by the members and believers during the long journey that Yewon Church stands where it does today. I've seen the many confessions and dedications of our Yewon Church members. Some have come with their bank accounts, and every Friday, there would be an abundance of confessions. But there is this one encourager. There is this one encourager who had insurance for cancer, and she had cancer, and so, but she could have gotten surgery with that insurance that she had. But she gave that amount as an offering, and she said, she said, Pastor, I've lived as long as I want to. I don't need surgery. If the Lord calls me, I need to go. And so I told her, no, encourager, you should go receive surgery. But she said, no, I don't want to. I want to give this offering to the Lord. And so her daughter and son-in-law came and gave offering with that insurance that she ha had. And a, a short while after that, she was called to heaven. to give insurance, that insurance money that she had for her cancer as offering. And there are many countless more confessions of faith such as that. While I reflect on the dedication and commitment of our Yewon believers, I am reminded of the words in 2 Corinthians 8, 1-3. It says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of a very severe trial. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity, for they gave according to their means and as I can testify and beyond their means of their own accord even beyond their own accord. Our Yewon community, which gives beyond their own accord and ability, God will accomplish the evangelization of the two their seven nations and 5,000 tribes. The testing of our materials is over because God did that with our construction. And when you give your heart, God will give you abundantly. Whenever Yewon Church goes on a camp, I've seen our elder, who had no passport. He said he was making one for the first time. That elder gave m much offering and had his own business. But he, and as I saw him making a passport for the first time, I realized that he had never even traveled overseas before. And there are many elders like that, but they were at the center of dedicating themselves to the church. Many people, they travel, go on vacations overseas. But the, but uh, this elder was making his passport for the first time. He had never gone overseas. But yet, he dedicates himself so much for the church. I could never forget that. That's how m the majority of our church members are like. And they go to all these camps even without having all any financial support. And I know each and every elder who could have gone on a vacation overseas, but they don't go. It's not that they don't go, it's that they do not go. 
because they don't have the financial leisure to do so. And yet they've given church offering for God. And I have so much gratitude and I was so deeply moved by many such as these individuals. And so when people ask me, how is that you were able to finish the construction of, of your church during COVID? I have so much to say. And by the grace of God, I bless you in the name of the Lord to take on a covenantal challenge with the right heart before God and become absolute disciples of Christ, expanding the four main taints. This is the conclusion. There are, these are the words of a doctor working in an oncology ward. In the cancer ward, there are many patients who, at best, have only two or six months left to live. Yet, because their days are so dull, many of them gather to play card games. Among them, there are those who win some money. So some say, hey, I won 20,000 won today, or I won 30 or 40,000 won today. And watching them be so happy. I think, oh, that person only has two months to live. That person only has six months to live at most. And yes, they're rejoicing over winning 20,000 or 30,000 won. As a doctor, I feel, I feel an endless sadness in my heart. In truth, none of us know what will happen to our lives. We don't know. Last night, one of my family members passed away, who is also a pastor, and so tonight I have to attend the funeral. While there is an order when it comes to how things come into this world, there is no order to how things leave. And therefore, each day is so precious. So for the remaining time that we have, we must know our true value, what the true value is that we must invest in. What is it that will eternally be left behind? What is the eternal reward? Before God, may I be able to live all in and concentrated lives. All our Yewon Church believers, May you completely break free from all introductory matters and stop wasting your time, your heart, and your materials. Instead, may you live a life of the main body of saving the 237 nations and 5,000 tribes and have the evidence to leave behind an eternal inheritance, legacy, and masterpiece. Let us pray. Father God, may all our Yale Church believers realize how important their heart is, and that God only sees our heart. May we no longer wander because of the introductory matters, but may we hold on to the word of God, and may we be able to give the rest of our lives to leave behind the eternal inheritance, legacy, and masterpiece. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.